thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, you may remember from your college days that professors come in two types. Um, I don't mean the men and the women or the liberals and the conservatives. I mean the cats and the dogs. Um, the dogs run around in packs and they bark a lot. Each one tries to become the top dog. Um, but the cats are solitary. They like to mark territory as their own uh, so that other cats will stay out. And among the professors of transportation planning, all the dogs chase after moving cars. Um, or they ride around in cars with their heads hanging out the windows, excited by speed. And the cats don't like riding around in cars, and they never hang their heads out the window. And they hate taking long trips in cars. Instead, cats inspect all of the parked cars, and they mark the tires. Um, and they would like to enjoy sleeping on the hood of a duly parked car when the engine is still warm. And they use this time to brood about the economics of parked cars. Well, cars are parked 95% of the time, as yours are now. Um, so while the dogs chase after the cars where they're moving in 5% of their lives, I thought I could find out something about the 95% of the lives of cars where they're parked. Uh, after all, in an audience of this size, some of you were probably even conceived in a parked car. Um, <laughs> I was pleased to learn that I was a, a parking rock star, uh, but that's not the same thing as a real rock star, although I have thought of changing my name to Shoot Dog. Uh, and I was pleased to be called the Yoda of urban planning until I remembered from Star Wars that, um, that Yoda was 800 years old, and uh, he seemed to me to speak mainly mystic nonsense. Um, and it's also difficult for a uh, someone from Los Angeles to come to Des Moines to give any advice about anything uh, d dealing with the cities because Des Moines is is unusually better than, than almost any other cities. Here's a graph showing these cities that have these three strengths of affordability and quality of life and economic strengths. Um, and many cities, you know, could be affordable but it's hard to find work or um, uh, has a qu good quality of life, but uh, it's not affordable. And here, right in the center of everything is Des Moines. You seem to have it all. Um, so what can I tell you that might help? Uh, well, uh, I can suggest uh, some ideas that come what, what other cities are doing that can help you uh, even think of ways to make Des Moines even better. Uh, more affordable, higher quality of life, and, and greater economic strength. And these, these ideas come from uh, trying to resolve problems in cities that uh, have really gone overboard in, in, in looking for parking. Uh, here's a picture of Silicon Valley. This is the campus of Cisco Systems. Um, but a lot of, in San Jose, a lot of Silicon Valley looks like this. The buildings are in the middle of a huge parking lot. They're in the center to minimize the walking distance from the parked cars to the building. You even wonder what the address of this building would be or who would ever want to walk on that, uh, that sidewalk. Uh, and uh, all the drivers are parked free. This is at uh, 2 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon, so you can see they've got a lot more parking uh, than, the, than they need. Uh, but uh, many cities, uh, including Des Moines, uh, in an odd way, uh, won't let anything other than this happen because they require so much off-street parking. Um, here's San Jose's minimum parking requirements. The green is the size of, uh, of the building, or a thousand square feet of the building. And the red is the size of the required parking lot. Uh, so I suppose dancing and skating are somewhat the same thing. And everyone has to shop, and, and, and they, um, uh, they have animals that need to be groomed. Um, but the city is requiring so much parking for anything new that it really has to look like a, a parking lot with some buildings in it. Uh, and here's Des Moines' uh, off-street parking requirements. They're lower, but they're still, in many cases, requiring more parking uh, than there is of the building itself. Um, uh, I suppose pool halls. Um, uh, I wonder if they still build those. Uh, but anyway, a pool hall seems to require a, a lot of parking. 
uh, and churches um, and taverns. I mean, taverns are the sort of the last place you would think you would want to encourage people to drive. <laughs> um, um, and uh, this has an effect on what Des Moines looks like. Here, here's one aerial view of Des Moines um, in the downtown. Um, and here's another one that was, uh, uh, these are Google uh, pictures, they're a little bit out of date. Here's the parking lot in front of City Hall that is now being replaced by a much bigger parking structure. I think the parking structure looks bigger than, than City Hall. Um, um, so, but I think this is a, a, a good thing in the sense that parking lots should be thought of as weed control for future building sites. But the problem is, it's hard to build anything on them because the new use has to have a lot of parking. Um, so that makes it difficult and expensive to replace a parking lot uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with, a, with a building. Here is Des Moines' proposed parking reforms. I understand that you've realized that maybe Des Moines has an awful lot of parking, is that especially west of the river, I don't think I've ever seen an area with so many parking garages covering an entire block. Uh, it's unusual, partly because I think Des Moines must allow these office buildings to have their parking on the adjacent block. So instead of being under the building uh, or in underground, or as a podium, uh, the, uh, the parking structure for the building is in the next block. And it takes up a lot of blocks in, 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 in Des Moines. I don't think I've ever seen a city with so many freestanding parking structures. But to some extent, this is uh, caused by urban planning. I think bad urban planning. Uh, here's a publication from the American Planning Association called Parking Standards. Uh, standards sound like a good thing. Um, like high standards, uh, but the report says nothing about standards. It does not say what parking requirements should be. It simply says what parking requirements are in other cities so the city can copy it some other city when they need to set a parking requirement. Here's the first page of the land uses that they have, 700 land uses that they have parking requirements for. Uh, I guess that boarding houses here. Um, uh, and then uh, adult land use is one of the first ones. And here's the page if you want to know what should be the parking requirements for an adult land use in Des Moines. And we don't have to say what adult land use means. Uh, everybody knows that. But it can be an adult massage parlor, adult bookstore, adult theater. Um, I think there are nine or ten different kinds of adult land use. Um, uh, but uh, we're in bad shape if this is what the American Planning Association thinks cities should look like. Um, it shows sort of a lack of vision of what a good city looks like. And I looked through these parking requirements, and each one taken alone, and I'm sure there was in Des Moines, each one taken alone looks as though somebody had put a lot of care and thought into what the parking requirement should be. When in, in fact, they, they really copy it from other cities because planners have no training in how to set a parking requirement. And so when you uh, uh, relate it to the number of people, it kind of makes sense that uh, you have to have one parking space for the person in the barber chair and one parking space for the barber. Um, there seem to be uh, gender differences that are hard to explain. Um, they, they require at least one parking space per person, except for religious land uses. Uh, and even there, there is a gender <laughs> discrimination. Um, but when you get away from people, it becomes harder to know how many parking spaces per what. And therefore, platters usually based it on the size of, of the site. And three spaces per thousand square feet uh, means about a thousand square feet of parking for a thousand square feet of the sex novelty shop because uh, in a parking structure or a parking lot, each parking space takes about 330 square feet for the parked car and the aisles for circulating in the garage. So three, uh, three park, whenever you require three parking spaces per thousand square feet of building, you're requiring as much less for parking as there is for the building. Um, and then when you get away from square feet, you have a hard time knowing, you know, what should it be? It has to be per something. Um, and it, planners get kind of inventive because 
uh, you have to have a parking requirement for everything. Uh, e even for the afterlife, you have to have a parking requirement. Um, um, and uh, so these are the parking requirements that uh, various cities have. Uh, the problem is that I, I'm sure many, I've never heard a planner disagree with what I'm saying uh, right now, is that uh, the planners have a lot of information that, uh, that they don't know. Uh, uh, they don't know how much the required parking spaces cost. And so cost is no concern. We don't, uh, 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 the price is no object. Parking is a need, and I'm not concerned with how much it costs, um, and, or how much it increases the ho price of housing, or of pool halls, or dance halls, or auction houses, or anything like that. We don't know how it affects that. Uh, or how it affects urban design. Say, in urban design, I think I mentioned it in, in, in Des Moines, it means to a lot of full block parking garages, there are no pleasure to walk past. Uh, who wants to walk past a parking lot or a parking garage? Uh, it, it, it makes for a, a strangely um, alienated experience walking along the beautiful sidewalks with flowers and trees and things like that on the street, but on the sidewalk, but right next to you is a parking garage. Or do these parking requirements uh, increase the number of cars coming to, to, the, to, to the district? Well, that must increase congestion and uh, carbon emissions and air pollution. We can't, we can't forget about carbon emissions now because we're all very uh, 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 concerned and even self-righteous about how we want to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and the planners have no uh, training in how to set a parking requirement. Uh, I've often spoken at universities. I always ask, uh, do you have any instruction at all in how to set parking requirements? And uh, they never have, because the professors have nothing to teach. Uh, so they can't have any uh, training in parking requirements. And I think the real problem is that uh, the cities are uh, politicizing what should be a business decision. Uh, it's a political decision how much parking should be. In the, in the presence of all this ignorance, uh, we have uh, political decisions on how much parking there should be. Um, and they're giving over to the government what should be market choices. Well, I did some research on how much these parking spaces cost. And this is just an average because the cost depends on the soil condition, the uh, dimensions of the site, uh, um, and uh, many other factors. So the, the, the price will vary from one uh, parking space, uh, uh, one parking garage to another for the same number of uh, parking spaces. But I did get data on the average cost of building uh, uh, parking structures. And here's a table of 12 cities in the United States. Um, and the average cost for underground parking is about $34,000 a space. And the average uh, cost of an above ground parking structure uh, is uh, 24000 a space. So, so when you look at these garages you're walking past in Des Moines, uh, they probably cost around $24,000 a space. Well, how does this compare with our ability to pay for, for these parking structures? Here, here's um, uh, data that's newly uh, being published by the United States Census Bureau is the, the median net wealth of U.S. households. It's a, uh, for, it's your, for a household, would be the value of all your assets minus your liabilities. And of course, many recent graduates from college would have more liabilities than assets. Uh, um, and uh, so we think we're a rich nation, but the, the, the median net wealth uh, of U.S. households in 2011 was about $69,000. So if, if, if they died and their estate was, was uh, totaled up, uh, the, uh, the heirs would get $69,000. Uh, but for, for minorities, it's much lower. It's, what is it? Uh, looks like something like uh, less than $8,000 uh, for a Hispanic family. So that half of all Hispanic families would have a net worth of less than uh, $8,000 and uh, for black families, less than $7,000. So this calls into question our ability to pay for all of these parking spaces. When you walk around Des Moines and you see all these parking spaces, you wonder, well, who is paying for these? It, it's not obvious who's paying for it, but it's, nobody seems to pay for it. 
everybody pays for it. It gets built into the cost of everything you do and everything you buy. Uh, somebody has to pay for the park. Just because the driver doesn't pay, doesn't mean the cost goes away. It's still there. It has, has to be paid by somebody, and usually it's not the driver in the United States. Um, a lot of families have negative net worth. That is, they have more debt than they have assets. Um, and we've made a world where it's very hard to get around without a car. Um, uh, and I think that then people are almost you know, greatly led into uh, borrowing money to buy a car, and sometimes these uh, awful subprime interest rates for, for car deed loans or something like that. So they pay a very high interest on, on money that they, they, uh, they borrow to buy a car so they can park free. Because uh, they, they, they're pay, they paid for their parking already indirectly. Um, well, I recommend three reforms. I, uh, I thought of a fourth one since I've been here in, 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 um, in Des Moines. Well, these are three reforms that uh, are, are working in other cities. Uh, uh, one is to charge the right price for curb parking. I mean, who could object with that? Uh, that, that, that sort of tautology. But by that, I mean charge the lowest price the city could charge and still have one or two open spaces on every block. So the spaces will be well used, most of the spaces will be occupied with uh, you know, customers for stores or restaurants and things like that, uh, but they're also readily available, well used and readily available. Um, so the uh, drivers will, 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 wherever they arrive, they'll see just what they want. And they'll have great parking karma, there'll be an open space waiting for them. And nobody wants to pay for, for on-street parking, including me. Uh, so how do you make this politically appealing? Uh, well, what some cities are doing is called uh, establishing parking benefit districts, which spend the meter revenue uh, to provide added public services in the metered neighborhoods. Say, in, in the East Village, it could be for um, uh, uh, Christmas lights, it could be for uh, flowers on the sidewalk. I haven't noticed as many flowers and trees on the sidewalks in this part of town. Uh, there's just spectacular sidewalk uh, foliage uh, uh, west, of, west of the river. But I think that if you could uh, use the money uh, for these flowers and trees or for Christmas lighting, or some cities, they have the lights of the trees all year long. You know, the little LED lights that sort of uh, 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 make the whole area uh, glow, glow at night. Or some cities are, you give free Wi-Fi to everybody in the area. They use the meter money so that if you have parking meters, you get free Wi-Fi. Uh, and if you don't have parking meters, you don't get re free Wi-Fi. So this makes neighborhoods, when they see it happening in another neighborhood, they say, let's do it in my neighborhood. Um, because often the people who pay for on-street parking in a, in a district, they come from out of the district. That they, they come to, to the stores and the restaurants and things like that. And they're the ones who are paying for parking. And as soon as they get out of their car, they're in a much better area because their meter money has paid for the, all the flowers and the trees and the street lighting and things like that. Uh, so that would make these, uh, these uh, prices politically uh, popular with the stakeholders. And they're the only people who count in whether you're gonna have parking meters, uh, that uh, people who, who live in a suburb well, what difference does that? they have no political influence? They're the one who will be paying for parking, <laughs> but it's the it's the the residents and the property owners and the merchants who will be benefiting from it. And then you could reduce or remove the off street parking requirements because nobody can say there's a shortage of parking. You know, every I, I haven't spent more than a uh, uh, well a few, a few hours, or maybe only my sleeping hours here in Des Moines without hearing people say there's a shortage of parking in the East Village, uh, which means there's a shortage of on-street parking, and it's free in the evening, and it's free on the weekends, and there's not enough of it. Uh, well, if you could say, well, maybe we should run the meters into the, into the evening and use the meter money to, uh, and charge the right price, and re use the meter money to do whatever the residents think is the best use of the money. And uh, then once you get rid of off-street parking requirements, you can build uh, uh, housing or uh, 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 shops or restaurants on what are now vacant lots. Uh, 
So the uh, demand-based prices, they, they, uh, they'll be different in the morning from the, than they are from the afternoon, um, and there'll be different prices on, on, on different blocks. And I was astonished in, in Des Moines, because I always look at, look at the park meters wherever I go, there are whole blocks of Des Moines would have park meters without a single car parked on them. And I think it means the price is too high, or maybe they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be operating at all at that time of day. Uh, I've never seen this anyplace else. So many unoccupied meter parking spaces. <laughs> in some cases, they're right next to a free parking lot in front of a in front of businesses, required parking lots in, in, in front of businesses. So I think in many parts of Des Moines, at many times of day, the price of uh, the meter price is too high. And and I was trying to tell the elected officials, you become an expert instantly, well, very quickly, on, uh, on the right price for curb parking. Because all you have to do is look at the, what you see on the block, and you'll know whether the price is too high or too low or just right. It's a principle for setting parking prices. At just the lowest price you can charge, um, and uh, everyone will have great parking karma. Um, and and it's, it's not the worst thing in the world. The worst thing in the world is be driving around the block, hunting for parking and cursing the traffic and breathing exhaust and staring at taillights and wondering when am I going to find a free parking space. Um, uh, so San Francisco is the first city to, uh, to try this out. And it, here's, uh, fortunately, they hired a good graphic designer to show what the problem was, that on some blocks, and I think I see this here in Des Moines, all the spaces are full, or sometimes all of them are full, and other blocks, they're um, uh, ample open spaces. So if you just nudge up the price on the top block and nudge it down on the bottom block, you can get that. That's what everybody would like to see. Uh, and some people think that this is a, you know, uh, a wrenching social change, maybe that Des Moines isn't ready for, and uh, uh, that it's, it's like a cultural revolution, uh, like the Reformation or Prohibition. Uh, but if you can't really move a car from one block to another, if that's too much for you, uh, then I think, what can the city do? I mean, is it, if, if they can't do that, uh, how can they do anything more complicated? Um, it's just a very small change, just nudging the price up and down. And the, the prices will vary from block to block, and from time of day. Uh, they don't change uh, it, more often than maybe every two or three months. They look at what has been happening in the past uh, two or three months, and then they readjust the prices, and then they stay the same for another three months. But the, the prices are different at different times of day and in different locations. So they're, they're not like surge pricing for Uber that, you know, in the most crowded hours, uh, a sudden surge, the price goes up. No, the price stays the same, uh, but it will be different on different blocks. Uh, it's just the Goldilocks principle of parking prices. Uh, we, as children, we learn that parts shouldn't be hot, too hot or too cold. Um, uh, so similarly, if no spaces are vacant, the price is too high. And about, if about 15% of the spaces are, are, are vacant, uh, the price is, is just right. So if you get the price right, say for, uh, uh, it's wrong on the left-hand diagram. This was a, uh, the results of a year-long study of Westwood Village next to UCLA. Uh, the spaces were almost always fully occupied. And there were about two cars circling every block on average during the day, hoping to see somebody pull out. And uh, if you see somebody pull out, then you can pull in. And that's the benefit of cruising for parking. Well, San Francisco, they didn't just have good graphics, but they had a short video, a two-minute video, I think. If you had to choose between this two-minute video and listening to the rest of my lecture, I think the two-minute video is probably more sensible. And so just look at this and see how it's not, it's not a plug-and-play operation, um, but it's easy to describe. Finding a parking space can be frustrating and time-consuming. It's estimated close to a third of city traffic is caused by drivers circling while looking for a space. Some drivers just give up and double park. This clogs our streets and needlessly pollutes the air. These cars slow down public transit and get in the way of emergency vehicles. And drivers focused on finding parking 
create a hazard for pedestrians and cyclists. There is a better way. San Francisco is testing new parking technology and a flexible approach to pricing that is designed to make parking work better for everyone. SF Park's goal is to have at least one parking space available per block. That way drivers can park near a specific destination without the need to circle the block or double park. This also provides a steadier flow of customers for business owners. SF Park provides safer and clearer streets for everyone. Here's how it works. Newly installed parking sensors detect when a parking space is available. Drivers will be able to check parking availability and rates online, by text message, and by smartphone before heading to their destination. This will help people decide whether to drive, take public transit, bike, or walk. When people choose to drive, new SF Park meters will make paying easier. In addition to taking coins, the new meters will accept credit cards and SFMTA parking cards. Parking time limits will be extended. Easier payment and extended time limits will help drivers avoid tickets. Prices at city-owned parking garages will be adjusted to provide an attractive alternative to meter parking. Parking rates will be adjusted based on demand, once a month, never by more than 50 cents. So, in areas where it seems nearly impossible to find a parking space, rates will increase until at least one space is available most of the time. And in areas where open parking spaces are plentiful, rates will decrease until most of the empty spaces fill, or until rates bottom up at as little as 25 cents per hour. SF Park is designed to ensure that drivers easily find an open space near their destination. SF Park will help people plan ahead, making informed decisions about the best time and the best way to visit busy areas. Um, uh, well, uh, what surprised me, and I think almost everybody, is that the average meter prices declined with SF Park. Everybody thought the price would go through the roof. Uh, but I think the same thing would happen in Des Moines. I think most parking meter prices in Des Moines would decline if you chose this policy. Uh, that there are so many empty spaces, you just have to open your eyes and pay attention as you walk along the street. There are so many unused spaces. And, and uh, as I was walking along Locust Street uh, from the west to east, just in this neighborhood um, a little bit east of us, I thought the price was just about right. Uh, that the, uh, uh, there were one or two open spaces on every block, but you could turn a corner and you could see all of the spaces were empty. It was the funniest thing I, I, I could see. That it was, uh, look at it yourself when you go out, just keep your eyes open. Um, so the, uh, uh, only nine blocks had, had reached $6 an hour, which is the cap. They had to put the cap on to make it, uh, to, to quell the fears that the prices would go through the roof. Um, um, but many, many, many more uh, prices have gone down to the minimum allowed, which is 25 cents an hour. Um, partly because most of them have been overpriced in the morning. Say, like, you, have, you start operating your meters at 8 a.m., and there's simply nobody there. Uh, I think that if there is a coffee shop or a, a, a restaurant that might like to attract people in the morning, uh, the parking meters are there making it a little bit inconvenient um, and earning very little or no money. Uh, so I think you should stop uh, operating the, the parking meters um, at least until 10 a.m. Uh, and the price should be free uh, if many spaces were that uh, remain empty at a zero price. I saw this on Sunday when I arrived, uh, that all the meters are free in the city, and I didn't see any block that was crowded. Uh, so I think free is the right price, uh, but it shouldn't not just be on Sunday. It should be any time when there are, are uh, empty spaces where the price should be zero. So the price could go down to zero uh, in the morning or whenever there's a very low demand. Um, so the, the, these performance parking prices, they, they're high only if they're, they need to be high in order to prevent uh, a scarcity of, of curb parking. So nobody will complain there's a shortage of parking. Um, 
So the uh, time it took to find a parking space declined uh, dramatically. The people were not, not circling the block. They, have a con they even had a control district, so you could be scientific and say, well, not much change to the control district. Uh, and there's a reduction in greenhouse gases and VMT of about 30%, because a lot of travel, at least in San Francisco, is not driving to where you're going, it's driving around after you get there, driving around hunting for parking. So you can cut the trip time quite a bit, uh, because the, the, there won't be this time hunting for parking at the end. And the number of parking tickets declined as well. Uh, they, uh, nobody has to double park. Uh, it's only if you choose not to pay. It isn't that there's a shortage of parking and you desperately have to park at a bus stop. Uh, no, that, uh, that there's, just, uh, there's just fewer violations. Uh, plus, they also extended the time limits at meters, uh, usually to four hours. So if your meter, uh, you, you don't have to worry about getting back before your meter time runs out. And the sales tax revenue in the metered areas increased when they put in these demand-based prices uh, so that uh, there, there could be uh, uh, vacancies that uh, the sales tax revenue, uh, which is a measure of uh, how the economic activity in the area for all the restaurants and bookstores and flower shops and everything else, it, it increased. So you can't say that the parking meters were doing uh, harm uh, to the neighborhood. Now, some people think uh, that, uh, uh, or used to think, uh, some people still think that you can't have prices that are different, prices at different times of day and on different blocks. You can't change them every two months. Uh, that's because they're thinking of the, 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 um, your great-great-grandfather's parking meter. Here's a picture of the first parking meter in the United States in 1935 in Oklahoma City. And it's really functionally the same as a new parking meter. Um, you put your money in and you hope to get back uh, before your time runs out, or you might get a ticket. Uh, and the early opposition to parking meters said that it's like an infernal combination of a, of a slot machine and an alarm clock. Uh, you, you're, you're always taking a chance that you, you might get a ticket if you don't, you don't get back in time. Um, but the new parking meters are much more sophisticated, and this is not the newest by any means, it's one on the UCLA campus. Uh, they designed them for Los Angeles to look like sort of a Mickey Mouse version of a regular parking meter, uh, just to uh, suggest it's a parking meter. Uh, but they can charge different prices at different times of day, and tell you, they can speak to you in different languages, or at least in the text can be in different languages, and tell you if your credit card is in upside down or anything like that. Um, and it doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you anywhere what the price is, because the price varies. Until you press a button and it tells you the price at that time. It's three dollars for the first hour and four dollars for the second hour. Um, and there are four different price, that's a price schedule, and there are four different price schedules during the daytime, depending on, on demand. You know, it's free late at night. Um, so you might say, well, this seems like an awful high price to charge students on a university campus. You know, this is gouging them. Well, I say you can't tell what the right price is until you look at the results. So, and, you know, some people think that or, or suspect <laughs> the professors have a lot of spare time on their hands, and, and, and there is some truth to that. And I set my camera up uh, across from eight parking spaces. Uh, governed by one of these multi-space meters. Uh, usually, typically, when you look at a block, and I saw this in, in Des Moines, there are about eight parallel parking spaces on, our, on every block. Some blocks are longer, some are shorter, but eight is an average. Uh, and this is what you would like to see if you're a driver and you, you, you arrive there. I took a picture every four minutes to see what happened during the hour. And you usually see somebody at the parking meter paying. Um, so uh, the two cars at the end never moved because it was, uh, you know, there's a two hour limit. Here's four minutes, you'll see the shadows move. Here's four minutes later, one car had uh, left and another car had arrived. Uh, and then here's another four minutes later. And uh, it keeps turning over. Uh, the, there was one time during this four, minute, the four minutes that there were, there were no cars available. But then four minutes later, um, a, a space opened up. Sometimes there were two spaces, 
And you can al almost always see somebody heading to the meter or heading from the meter. Um, but it's, uh, it looks as though the, the park is operating well. Uh, say, if you had a, a, a store or a restaurant, uh, wouldn't you like to see this happening in front of your restaurant? Uh, that this is really what would be the healthiest for the commerce in the area. I think once there were three spaces, that was the most. But they, they filled up. I think that's probably as good as it's going to get, given the uh, you know, changeable, unpredictable demand uh, uh, during the hour. And, and the, during the time when there are no spaces available in those eight, there, there's, there's another eight next to them. You just want to have it so that most blocks, most of the time, uh, have one or two open spaces. So you never have to drive more than one or two blocks. Uh, so you, know, you have to sum it up with a bar chart. Most of the time there was one space available. One four minute period there was uh, no basic, vacant spaces available. But I think this is really much as good as you're going to get. Um, do you think that any parking meters in Des Moines work this well? If any of you have ever looked, not everybody looks at parking meters the way I do. Uh, but Look at it through the eyes of a merchant uh, or a restaurant or something like that. Do you think parking meters work in Des Moines as well as this does? Or would you prefer what you see in Des Moines to what this is? I don't think so. It isn't just Des Moines, it's any city. <laughs> I guess I ask this question anywhere. And nobody thinks their city's parking meters work this well. Um, so it comes from charging the right price. It is easy to describe the right price. Um, here, should it be higher at this location? Well, no, I don't think so, because there would be more open spaces, uh, and the parking spaces wouldn't be delivering uh, people to, this is a law library, it's right in front of Many people want to rush in and get something and come out. Um, if it were higher, uh, then the, not a, fewer people would be using it. If it were lower, people would get there and complain about a lack of parking. Uh, so it's the Goldilocks principle of, of parking prices. Not too high, not too low, but just right. It's also like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography. I know it when I see it. It's very easy for anybody, a city council member, a city staff member, to look at the uh, block and just say, the price is wrong. Uh, it's very easy to remedy now because the, the prices um, can be uh, uh, changed remotely. You don't have to touch the meter. You do it, you do it from uh, City Hall. So everybody knows the mantra, the, the uh, uh, information technology. Information wants to be free, but parking wants to be paid for. It's very expensive. It's a big mistake to ignore the cost of the parking and for the city to require so much of it that there's no shortage. Uh, so I think one of the reasons, not in Des Moines, uh, but one of the reasons that uh, cities are, are, are find this appealing is because it eliminates all this driving around hunting for parking, and not just in the United States, but in China or India or Nigeria. Um, there's a lot of people uh, uh, driving around hunting for parking. Um, um, and here's a, 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 a summary of studies that have been done on, on uh, cruising for parking, on what share of the traffic was cruising, or how long it took to find a space. It's um, 90 years ago was the first study, appropriately, in Detroit. Um, and they just uh, looked at the license plate of every car circling in the traffic, and they found many of the license plates keep coming around. And they, by that kind of counting, they figured out what uh, share of the traffic is cruising. Um, and um, the most recent one was in Barcelona, uh, where they were interviewing people who were stopped at traffic lights and asked them, are you cruising for parking? Um, so in these areas where there is a lot of cruising, which is where you look for cruising and try to measure it, about a third of the traffic was cruising for parking and it took about seven minutes to find a space. This is uh, uh, 21 studies in 13 cities on four continents. So um, I think it's a worldwide problem. Here is a, a study that's maybe my favorite. It was done in Chicago just before World War II and they stationed a lot of students at every corner 
who with with uh, a very careful watches, and they, um, they 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 looked every time there was a car that it came to an intersection and sort of they noted whether it went straight ahead or left or right at exactly the time, and they uh, uh, noted the license plate number, so they could then trace the path of the uh, cars. Uh, so some people were just focused on a single block, and that's the only thing they would do. Other people thought, well, they're looking for better chances someplace else. They were looking for something new, thinking that they'd have a better luck someplace else. But we all feel like this when we're doing it, is that it, it seems to be we're, we're, we're less successful than everybody else. And, and in dense traffic, you try to uh, not to follow somebody who's cruising, so you, you sort of hold back which means you're slowing down the traffic. Uh, and as the traffic is slower, the carbon emissions are greater per mile traveled, and, the, um, uh, and it congests the traffic, because you're holding back, uh, hoping that somebody will pull out after the guy ahead of you uh, passes. And this leads to a lot of very dangerous, uh, risky behavior. I've seen many people make a U-turn in the middle of the street when they see a, a space open up on the other side, of course it's illegal, I've seen it cause accidents to Westwood Village. And here's some grainy footage I got uh, on a trip to, to Washington, D.C., where the uh, uh, parking has been underpriced until recently, and they, they, um, there's a lot of cruising and very dangerous behavior. Uh, here's this uh, it's kind of grainy on an old cell phone. <laughs> Well, I, I was able to interview the driver after she got out of the car. <laughs> and she said she does whatever it takes to get a curb parking space. Well, to make the, these, these prices right so you don't have to uh, park the way she did, <laughs> then I think you could have these parking benefit districts. Here's one in, in uh, Pas Old Pasadena, and they put uh, stickers on the meter saying where the money goes. It doesn't go into City Hall. Um, it's using the revenue to generate su policy, su uh, political support for the Goldilocks prices. Uh, so I'll just show how this policy worked in, 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 um, in Pasadena. It gets it counters the idea uh, that the money is wasted or just disappears. Because politically, it does just disappear. When you put the money in the parking meter, you don't know where it goes. Uh, nobody knows where it goes, um, although you have your suspicions. Uh, and you have suspicions about transportation planners. They're trying to get you out of your car that this is the goal of transportation policy. When it's exactly the opposite in, in, in Des Moines. With all these parking structures, the policy is to get you into your car. There is so much free parking and such expensive um, uh, parking structures. The social engineering that is to get people into the car. I'm not talking about a war on cars. I'm saying that now there is a war for cars. Um, and if you want to be neutral, the parking requirements have weighed the, 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 or the balance way towards using cars. Uh, some people think that uh, charging for parking is un-American. Uh, well, I think it's very American policy to charge people for what they use. You know, we're not, we didn't become a great nation by being a bunch of freeloaders, but when it comes to parking, that's our policy. We want to be freeloaders. We don't want to pay for parking. Here's a scene in the residential neighborhood um, near the Los Angeles Coliseum during the 1984 Olympics. But it happens during any event at the Coliseum, is that the residents park their cars on the street and they rent, around, rent out their driveways. So it's a very American policy to charge people for what they're getting, especially if you get the money. Um, so uh, this. Pasadena sort of realized that uh, uh, it, it was a, a historic area, old Pasadena. Uh, they had wonderful buildings in terrible condition. Many of them were uh, 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 empty at the ground level, and almost all of them were empty above the, uh, the ground level. Um, people thought it would never recover. Uh, 
the, the, the buildings had been, uh, had been decaying for, for 50 years. Uh, and here's what it looks like now. How did city planning change what had been a commercial skid row into one of the most uh, desirable destinations in Southern California. Over 30,000 people come to walk around in Pasadena on an average weekend, just because they like being there. It, one way to, to make a place popular is you say, well, what do other, other people like? Well, they like other people. Uh, and in Des Moines, I've been noticed when I've been walking, often I'm the only person on the block, um, especially at night. Uh, and especially if you're, if you're an old person at night and alone on the street, maybe it's not unsafe in Des Moines, but it doesn't feel safe. Anyway, there are tons of people walking around in Pasadena now. What explains the, the change from a commercial skid row into such a desirable area? Well, it comes with parking meters with the revenue return that the, the city wanted to put in uh, parking meters because the, the, the merchants and their, and their employees were parking on the street and moving their cars every two hours and complaining that there's no parking for their customers. Uh, and therefore, they wanted parking garages to be built. Um, so the city said, well, let's put in uh, parking meters. And the, everybody said, no way. It'll chase away the few customers we still have and send them to a, 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 a in-town mall that the city had built with a $50 million subsidy for, for parking. Uh, so the uh, city bought the parking meters and they had to store them for, for uh, two years while they argued and finally they said, all right, if we put in the parking meters, uh, we'll uh, uh, spend the money on uh, improving old Pasadena. The merchant said, that's different. Why didn't you tell us that? Uh, Let's put in the parking meters. Let's run them till midnight. Let's just charge a high price. And the only thing that changed was the city said, if we put in the parking meters, we will spend the money on what you want. They rebuilt all of the sidewalks. Um, they cleaned up all of the alleys. They put in historic street furniture. Uh, they have extra police protection. They uh, power wash the sidewalks every two weeks and they, they sweep them every night, they remove graffiti every night. There's no graffiti anymore, but there used to be. Um, uh, so connecting the, the meter revenues uh, directly to added public services and local control are largely responsible uh, for the program's success. Uh, and here's a quote from the uh, head of the business district, uh, uh, the zoning advisory board, they, they appointed a board from a, a merchants and land property owners and residents in the area to advise on what to do with the money. It's still the city's money, but the city is saying we're going to spend it in, in this neighborhood if you put in the parking meters. And the city gets to decide, but they, they, um, they take advice from this, this board. And here is a, a Maryland Buchanan said, when we figured out that the money would stay here, that the money would be used to improve the amenities, it was an easy sell. So if you want it to be an easy sell to have you know, parking meters operate in the East Village in the evening, you can say, well, if you put it in, we'll ask you, what is your highest priority? I mean, do you want uh, Christmas lights? Do you want better street furniture? Um, do you want free Wi-Fi? Uh, just, uh, it's, it's the residents and the, the stakeholders who should, should, should be asked what they want. Uh, so there were, this was, uh, there's a pawn shop in the corner. It's still there, but it's, uh, the whole block is fixed up. They planted wonderful new trees, mature trees, uh, and the, uh, the property owners began restoring their buildings. Uh, they had been falling apart for many years, and uh, restoring a, a historic building is a very expensive process. It didn't, it, it didn't pay in the old days because the rents didn't justify it. But once the city had done what only the city could do, which is to provide all these wonderful public services, then the landlords came through with heavy expenditures on historic preservation, T taking off years of paint over bricks and things like that, um, and uh, uh, bringing up to uh, the historic standards. Here, here's a tire warehouse that had been empty for uh, over 10 years became a department store with no parking. Um, uh, the alleys, which were in terrible shape, you know, with mattresses and dead animals and things like that, were cleaned up. The wires were put underground. There were 
planted trees and made it um, uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, walking areas. Uh, how many places do people want to go to walk around in alleys in the United States? Uh, and the, the, the merchants now have two front doors, one onto the main street and then one onto these beautiful alleys. The restaurants have outdoor cafes there. Uh, that uh, it's a wonderful place to walk around in the alleys day or night. Uh, uh, and here's what it looks like now. Uh, and it, a, a lot of the money, uh, I think about $400,000 of the, of the, of the Park Meter Redmond goes to the Business Improvement District to uh, uh, provide the services. Um, and another, I think $400,000 goes for debt service. On the, they borrowed all the money to do this. Uh, you can borrow against meter revenue. And then the rest of it pays for um, added police protection and things like that. Here's another town in California that it, it, in Ventura, uh, on the beach between Santa Barbara and LA, and they, um, they put in meters with a parking benefit district after people had bitterly opposed meters for, for, for generations, and they, because they had voted out the mayor and city council when they put in meters in the 1950s. And so all the politicians had that in their DNA, that it's a very risky thing to do. But when they put in the uh, parking benefit district with the meters, um, uh, most people said, yes, we like it. Um, and uh, they, they use, uh, in Ventura, you, you have to enforce the parking meters, uh, so they hired police cadets who were costumed as police officers and show people, they're like ambassadors of the business improvement district, they show how people use the, uh, the meters and things like that. Uh, but because they're costumed as police officers and were interns, they, they, look like police, <laughs> they look like police officers and there's a big reduction in crime. People saw there was somebody um, managing the district. Uh, it's hard to get into the police uh, uh, department. Um, so many of these were realtors who had lost their job in the recession and they wanted to become police officers. Here was a way that they could do it by being essentially an intern. Um, and they give free Wi-Fi uh, to the whole neighborhood. Uh, so I think once you know that, if you don't have the meter, if, if, we, go, if we voted out the meters this time, you'd lose all the police officers, you'd lose the free Wi-Fi, you'd lose all the benefits. It's hard to believe that they're going to vote out the parking meters this time. And it's spreading around here in, uh, uh, I think, uh, that because people realize it's a transportation management tool, which is the way I sell it to an audience when I'm talking about transportation, uh, because if there's cruising uh, or hunting for parking, uh, charging the right price, which is bumping it up, uh, will mean that um, uh, that'll uh, reduce traffic congestion and air pollution and CO2 emissions. But it's also an economic development tool. Uh, and I think this is the most important part of it, say in Pasadena, that people won't know um, that the parking meters are reducing CO2 emissions, uh, but they know that it's making the area a lot better place. It, so in terms of creating public support for it, the economic development is, the, the meter money is the big draw for it. They want the money. And because when I was in Ventura, I had been there to speak to the city council, uh, before the parking benefit district, I went afterwards when it was, um, th that's right, I guess it was before they were put in. I spoke at the city council, but I stayed there three days uh, afterwards because I'd never stayed in Ventura. They have a lovely sort of uh, uh, main street from uh, the late 1900s. And I went to restaurants, uh, and every time I went into a restaurant, the head waiter or the owner or somebody would come over and. Uh, asked me, uh, you know, say, oh, I really liked your talk. And I said, well, what do you like about the meters? Is it the reduction congestion or pollution? They looked at me as though I was the dumbest person on earth. And they said, no, we want the money. See, they didn't want it because it was uh, improving transportation. They wanted it because they wanted the, the, the money. Um, uh, uh, Massachusetts, or that should say in 2016, uh, the Massachusetts legislature, which had for decades had previously prohibited cities from raising the, uh, the meter rate above what it was necessary to pay for operating the meters, um, uh, passed, I like this, Park Act. Uh, what is it? Parking Advancements for the Rehabilitation. 
revitalization of communities, um, which now authorizes cities to um, set up uh, parking benefit districts and to say that the cities can uh, 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 establish the meter rate uh, to achieve transportation goals and they can spend the money uh, to pay for uh, transportation improvements, uh, improving the sidewalks and things like that. Um, so um, and it's the simplest piece of legislation I've ever seen. It's very clear, very simple. This is the whole thing I'm showing, the law. Uh, and it took effect um, in uh, uh, January of this year, um, uh, January 1. And here on January 3, here's an article in the uh, Boston Globe. They're starting their first parking benefit industry. As soon as they were allowed to do it, uh, they, they have two, two versions of it. One they, and one they jumped the price up to 375 an hour, and the other one they made them well, nudge it up or down depending on uh, uh, what, what, the, uh, what we see on the ground. Um, so I think that they, they're making it clear that the, the neighborhoods are going to get something out of this other than higher prices at the meters. Um, um, and in the other area, they, um, uh, they will change every two months, that's right. Uh, and it just depends on how full the spaces are. It's as simple as that. Um, and once cities begin doing this, and other cities are, are doing it as well, Seattle does it, Los Angeles does it, uh, um, Washington DC is doing it now. Uh, and then once you do that, uh, if it works, uh, uh, it's a little bit early to say it'll work really well, you could deal with these off-street parking requirements. Um, uh, Zoning requires several homes for every car, you know, at work, at the shopping center, at the grocery store, at the theater. Um, uh, so there's several parking spaces for every car, but we have homeless people. So zoning is really uh, entering it on the side of cars, making housing more expensive and less of it, uh, so that we can have room for all of our cars. And meanwhile, we have homeless people. What would you do with this place? Um, well, I went there, as if you're a car, it's a great place. You know, Silicon Valley is a beautiful area. Great climate, wonderful hills, and things like that. But only cars can enjoy it. Uh, what might this parking look like if we could convert some of it to housing? And this is where now all planners know how to use Photoshop to show what they're doing. I spoke to the Congress of New Urbanism, so I took some newly clean buildings at the University of London uh, uh, so to show what it could look like. You could put uh, what ur new urbanists call a liner buildings around the parking lot. So when you're walking around on the sidewalk, it looks like a real city. Um, uh, but it's a very thin real city, and behind it is all that parking. And you have to charge for the parking. And it's very easy to build on this kind of land because under one ownership, there's no land assembly, it's not brown fields. You could build it without underground parking and without parking structures. It's just you have to share that parking with the people who work in the building. Uh, at the center, this, if, the, if there are employees who, 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 who uh, live in the building, the, the housing, and walk to the building, you can walk to work. Um, uh, or if you live there and you work someplace else, you could leave in the morning and your parking space will be available so for somebody who drives to this, this office building. Well, I don't think you would see this in, in, in California. The building is too handsome. So I just took a garden variety building from uh, 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 apartment building from downtown LA, which is ground floor retail. I think it's a daycare center or a children's school, some kind of school on the bottom. Uh, and with Photoshop, you can put it there very easily. Um, it's a more likely outcome. It could be offices, it could be uh, guard departments, it could be anything. But if you put it on the perimeter of that, uh, of that parking lot, uh, you would have uh, job adjacent housing, um, and which could be built without parking. Um, and then if that works out, uh, they could build more. It just has to be allowed. The th important thing is the city won't allow that now because if you built it there, you'd have to replace the parking that's required for the Cisco systems and you'd have to build more parking for the housing. Cities just will not let this happen if they have parking requirements. Here's a picture of the building in downtown LA um, and nothing special. Um, it could be any kind of building. It could be 
uh, single family houses, I suppose. And so you could keep on building. Uh, uh, in an area where people say the housing is so expensive, the commutes are so long, and the traffic is so awful, and the pollution is world class. Uh, but before we can do this, we have to do three things. We have to get the, the price of on-street parking right, because if people uh, were lived in there and the parking was free on the street, and they had to pay for a parking behind the house, they'd want to park free on the street. So you have to charge the right price for parking on the street. So I think there are a, a cascade of benefits that would uh, flow from this, uh, that it would create jobs, you know, that we can import cars and fuel, but we can't import housing. Uh, there would be a lot of jobs for, for, for architects and drywallers and plumbers and electricians and even urban planners. Uh, and it would increase the housing supply right where we want the housing, right next to the jobs. Um, and it would reduce the time we were forced to spend commuting. Uh, and we have to import a lot of cars and fuel, but uh, that would, uh, we need less of both of those. Um, and uh, it has to reduce traffic congestion and air pollution. Um, and it would increase the demand for smart parking technology, the, the new kind of meters that we have, uh, paying for, paying by cell phone, and uh, uh, Des Moines is edging into the, this most modern kind of uh, 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 parking technology, and it was slow climate change. You have to uh, say that. Uh, so I think the, the, the basic thing about minimum parking requirements is that the city should back out. Uh, the the, the uh, number of parking spaces should be a business decision. Not having parking requirements doesn't mean there will be no parking. Uh, the developers will put in parking if they think their tenants want it. Uh, but they know much, the developer knows much more about what their tenants' <laughs> uh, demands are and how much the parking spaces cost. Uh, uh, see, I think that uh, we should regulate uh, 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 quantity. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. That, oh, yes, I'm sorry. That, uh, I guess I didn't. Uh, I, I changed my notes because of something that happened uh, yesterday. Um, uh, that I, I uh, uh, want to sp pick, finish off with what's called parking cash out. Um, uh, most people, uh, as I understand it, in, in, uh, in Des Moines get employer paid parking. Uh, if you drive to work, you get a free parking space at work. So the employers pay for parking at work if you're willing to pay for driving to work. If you don't drive to work, you don't get anything. Um, uh, you just don't get a subsidy. But that has causes problems, I think, that uh, it encourages people to solo drive. Because if you could park free at work, that's an invitation to drive to work alone. Uh, California addressed this problem with a parking cash out law that the employers has to offer uh, commuters uh, that they offer free parking to, they have to offer them the option to take the cash value of it. If I offer you uh, 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 free parking at work, and I pay $200 a month to the landlord for the space, I have to offer you $200 if you don't take the parking. So it just treats everybody equally. Regardless of how you get to work, I'll either give you $200 for parking, or I'll give you $200 for roller skating, or for uh, walking, or bicycling, or riding the bus, or carpooling. Um, so it isn't charging anybody for parking. Uh, you, you still get to park free. But the free parking has an opportunity cost because you forego cash um, if you take the free parking. And this sort of subtly increases the price of solar driving. I'm not taking anything away from you. I'm just expanding the benefit so that you could use it any way you want. Uh, and uh, I've studied the results. Some commuters cash out. Most don't. Most continue uh, driving to work free. But some people, and that's what, we don't have to change everybody's behavior. We just have to change a few people's behavior. Um, some people say, I'd rather have the cash. Um, and there are a lot of advantages. So it gives a new choice. It doesn't take anything away. It gives people a new choice. Um, and it rewards the alternatives for solar driving, which employer paid parking alone doesn't. Uh, and therefore, it reduces the number of vehicle trips. Um, and it treats everybody equally. It's fair. Everybody understands that it's fairer than, say, the drivers get a big subsidy and nobody else gets anything. 
Uh, and it costs firms very little because if people take cash rather than the parking, well, what difference does that make to the employer? Um, it just says you can't confine your subsidy to driving. And it means that the employees uh, will, won't object to this. The employees are not going to, uh, if they start charging for parking, the employees would object. The unions would object. But the new unions do not object to have expanding the, the benefit to uh, cash out. And here was the, the results of a, a, a survey of a number of firms in Los Angeles when the uh, well, law was uh, passed. And it led to, a, a, what is it, I think, a, a 17 percent reduction in the number of, of uh, solo drivers. It led to a big increase in carpooling and also a big increase in transit use, but more to carpooling. So you don't have to have good transit to make this work. Uh, people can carpool or they can bike. And here are the comments, comments from the employers that the, I interviewed the employers after they started, and they thought it was great. They wondered why they hadn't thought of it themselves, uh, that, they, that the, all the employees liked the idea, they liked the cash in hand, and it does add to their paycheck. Uh, the employees love it. Uh, the ones who continue to drive alone, there's no harm to them. Uh, many of the employees thought better of their company, thinking that the company is trying to solve the problem, uh, that it's trying to be green, that they feel, and it's advertised to any new employees as a new benefit. It's a better benefit package than just employer-paid parking. I like the last one. Cash works very well for us. Well, of course it does. It works very well for everybody. It's as simple as that. So I think we should subsidize people and not parking. Uh, so I thought of, well, what would you do in Des Moines? I'm, uh, I'm big on telling people what to do. I think Des Moines owns a lot of public parking structures. And I think it, uh, the, the employers have to lease parking from the city to offer free to employees. And I think that if Des Moines put in the lease for, with, for all new uh, leases, that if you rent in this garage and you offer it free to your employees, you have to offer the uh, uh, employee the option to take it in cash. That's a condition of leasing a parking space in our garage. Uh, because if you don't have that kind of thing, the city is enabling uh, employer paid parking with no alternative. So I don't think anybody would think this is unfair of the city to say, that if you want to lease parking for us, you have to treat bicyclists and uh, pedestrians and bus riders equally. Uh, and you can just try it in one garage and see how it works out. Uh, so I, that's, uh, that's came to me as I was talking to people in Des Moines. Uh, that you have so many uh, 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 parking structures that it would allow you to do this. Um, I think some people would take the cash. Um, and then the city would have uh, some more parking spaces to sell. Uh, see, if the, if, the, if the city, they could use it for transients or they could give it to more employees. I, I mean, to more employers. I've heard that some employers want to rent parking spaces in the city's garages and there are no parking spaces to sell to them. So if some people who are offered free parking uh, take, take the cash, this will be more spaces to sell to employers. Uh, here's a World War II uh, uh, poster. I think we need more thinking like this. Um, so I think there's a lot of, uh, I think, uh, uh, political, can be a lot of political support for the ideas across the political spectrum, uh, regardless of whether you, you're on the left uh, or on the right. Uh, that it, it, there's something for everybody. Um, uh, liberals will see that it uh, uh, increases public spending. Uh, there will be more public services. Uh, and conservatives will see that it relies on the market uh, and, it'll, and free them from regulation. Um, and the environmentalists have a lot to gain from this. Can you imagine any green saying this is a bad idea? Uh, these ideas that I've been talking about. Um, and businesses will see that they have a, a free hand in what they want to do. They're not told how many parking spaces to provide. Um, they're not told what they have to do in order to get a permit to open. Um, and the uh, new urbanists will see that we could have more attractive cities and not be overrun by cars. Um, and the libertarians, uh, we have some of those, uh, 
Uh, it means that a lot of choices will shift from the government to individuals. The government won't be making decisions for businesses. Um, and people who are uh, property rights advocates will say, well, I have more freedom to do with my property what I want to do. Um, and developers will certainly see that it reduces building costs. Um, that you could have less parking if you want to provide less parking. The city will no longer be telling you to spend uh, $40,000 a year per parking space before they'll allow you to build a building. Um, and the residents, the stakeholders, will see these new public services. Uh, some of the city, uh, the streets of Des Moines have these wonderful sort of hanging baskets of flowers or little gardens everywhere. Parking meters can pay for that. It wouldn't be just in front of the new buildings and the, and the high rise. It would be anywhere that has parking meters. Um, and affordable housing advocates will see that it's a lot cheaper to build uh, 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 housing uh, well served by transit with fewer parking spaces. Uh, and there are always some neighborhood activists who want to devolve decisions to the neighborhood, and this would allow that. And the biggest beneficiaries, I think, are local elected officials who won't have to spend hours of city council meetings wondering about what the price of curb parking should be in the East Village or whether op meters would operate until 9 o'clock. They should devolve these decisions to, the, to, the, to their staff and to the citizen, affected citizens. The, the city council doesn't know anything about uh, professional about parking, except uh, that they know they don't want to be yelled at uh, by constituents. Um, so I think they have a lot of very talented staff members who, if the city said, our policy is to, our, 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 our responsibility is set the policy, and our policy is that we want one or two open spaces on every block, and we can see it for ourselves whether you're achieving it. And then it becomes the responsibility of the staff to adjust prices up or down to achieve that result. The staff are very much better trained about how to deal with um, uh, decisions like that than city council members are. It would depoliticize the parking. Once the, the city council sets the policy, and this was happens in other cities, they say, we want to see one or two open spaces on every block. It's up to the staff to do it, and they can just look out the window and see whether the staff are doing a good job. What will we do with all the cars we don't need anymore? Well, here's a sculpture I like in France called Long-Term Parking. Um, uh, and all these massive garages we've built, uh, well, we can put those to interesting new uses. I think there are a lot of people in Des Moines who could be recruited for this. Um, um, I think you can't do better than to end with a quotation from Jane Jacobs. Um, I think that, uh, that Des Moines and the, the United States is not rich and, and, and well endowed because of what we have done. We have inherited this. And I'm not sure that we are doing as much for the future as the past did for us. If you think you do even worry about climate change, are we really doing our part to, uh, with our parking policies to reduce climate change? I don't think so. We're making it worse. Um, I think we may need to make more gifts to the future. Um, Here's a quote from uh, President Eisenhower's famous farewell address. Um, and I think we are um, uh, plundering for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow in a way that President Eisenhower could never have imagined. I think we're, we're, we're living for ourselves and for now. And then our greatest writer among presidents is uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I think our case is due. We have new problems. Uh, we're stuck in old ways of doing things and old ways of thinking, and it's time to, to act anew. And we have the technology to do it, we have the uh, precedence for doing it, and I think you could do it in Des Moines. Here's a, uh, the only real solution to the parking problem. GM is working on this, but uh, until the, uh, the, this is the best kind of self-driving car, and I think that if we, that comes about, we'll, we'll, that would solve the parking problem. Until then, we have to do it ourselves. Uh, well, that's about all I know, so I better stop. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you.